Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Episode 77 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Holy Blood, Holy Grail. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So, in 1982, three British authors published a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. It discussed a secret conspiracy to control the future of Europe. It also made startling allegations about European history, the Bible, and the foundations of the Christian faith. In time, it became the basis of the best-selling book and the blockbuster movie The Da Vinci Code. What did Holy Blood, Holy Grail say, and how reliable is it? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So first, Jimmy, we should probably mention that this is a patron's episode. Yes, uh, every month we ask the patrons what they'd like to hear about, and this month they said they'd like to hear about Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So that's what we're doing, because we like our patrons and want to reward them. Excellent. So folks, if you want to get a chance to be able to help choose the topics for this ep- uh, for this podcast, you could become a patron at sqpn.com slash give. So, uh, Jimmy, first, uh, any preliminary remarks before we get into the mystery? Yeah, this mystery involves France, and thus a lot of French names. Like there's, for example, there's a priest coming up named Saunier. You know, so my usual disclaimer about French pronunciation applies. Uh, (laughs) Also, I read uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail back in the 1980s, not long after it came out. And at the time, I was a new Christian. And so I was having to grapple with some controversial ideas without the background that I have now. And uh, I wasn't persuaded by them, but dealing with them was, you know, a little harder than than it was now. And so I'm in this podcast, I'm revisiting ideas that I had to interact with when I was brand new to the Christian faith. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, we often talk about uh, your connections to to some of the topics we talk about. I actually have a connection to the Da Vinci Code, which uh-huh. we, talk, we had just mentioned. When the book first came out, I picked it up because I was curious. I looked in the acknowledgments, and uh, at the time, I worked for a news service called Catholic World News, and, and uh, Brown, the, the author of the book— credited Catholic World News. He thanked us for <laughs> opening with the book. And uh, yeah. Philip Lawler and I, who Philip was the editor, right. uh, tried to figure out why we were being credited. We're not quite sure. Maybe he used us as a resource for looking things up. But uh, it was not an acknowledgement that actually we thought was a good thing. For yeah, us uh, in thank you for dragging our name into this. <laughs> yes. So I just thought I'd mention that. So, but we're not talking about the Da Vinci Code. We're talking about Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So, Jimmy, who wrote Holy Blood, Holy Grail? The book had three authors. Their names were Michael Bajant, Richard Lee, and Henry Lincoln. Michael Bajant was born in 1948 in New Zealand, but he later moved to England. He was raised Catholic but left the faith at an early age, and he worked in the photographic department at the BBC. Later, he got a master's degree in mysticism and religious psychology at the University of Kent. And I didn't know you could get a master's degree in (laughs) mysticism and religious psychology, but he did. Uh, He was also an active Freemason, and he died of a brain hemorrhage in 2013 at the age of 65. The second author, Richard Lee, was born in 1943 in America, and he also moved to the UK. He was a novelist and a short story writer, and he died of a heart condition in 2006 at the age of 64. Henry Lincoln, the third author, was born in 1930 in England. He was a scriptwriter, television presenter, and actor. He wrote three serials for Doctor Who in the Patrick Troughton era. So there's a Secrets of Doctor Who connection here. Uh, The (laughs) serials he wrote were The Abominable Snowmen, The Web of Fear, and The Dominators. Uh, He is still alive. He lives in France, and today he's 89 years old. So how did these three authors get the idea idea for Holy Blood, Holy Grail? In 1969, Henry Lincoln was on a trip to France, and he picked up a book by a French author named Gerard Desaid. The original title of the book, it appeared under a few different titles, but the original title, which is what we'll use, was L'Or de Renes. 
and that translates into English as the gold of Rene's. The book concerned a 19th century French priest named Berenger Saunier. He served in the village rene le chateau from 1885, so into the 19th century, to 1909. And when his bishop tried to transfer him, he refused and was suspended. Mm. Uh, he remained in Rene's Le Chateau until his death in 1917, functioning as a rogue priest without a parish. Mm. Uh, he apparently had a substantial source of wealth, which became the basis of various conspiracy theories after his death. That was part of what led Desed to write about him. And after uh, reading Desed's book, Henry Lincoln went back to England and in the 1970s made several documentaries about Saunier. The research that Lincoln did with his co-authors led them to write Holy Blood, Holy Grail, or the British title was The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, which was published in 1982. In 2003, the American author Dan Brown then used ideas from Holy Blood, Holy Grail as the basis of his novel, The Da Vinci Code. Speaking of Sonier's wealth, how did people explain where he got all this money from? There were different theories. In the 1950s, one French author claimed that Sonier had found secret papers under the altar in his church that led him to discover part of a treasure that dated to the 1200s and that had been amassed by Queen Blanche of Castile, the wife of King Louis VIII. But Bajent Lee and Lincoln speculate it may have been connected to several different historical sources, including treasures owned by our old friends the Knights Templar, who we talked about in episode 56, mm -hmm. or they said it might have belonged to Cathar heretics who were common in the region in the Middle Ages, or to King Dagobert II of the Merovingian kings that had previously ruled the area, or the Visigoths who had conquered Rome and could have brought the treasure from there, or even the treasure of the temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed in AD 70, as we talked about in episode 16. They write, Treasure, then, may well have been the source of Sonier's unexplained wealth. The priest may have discovered any of several treasures, or he may have discovered a single treasure that had repeatedly changed hands through the centuries, passing perhaps from the Temple of Jerusalem, to the Romans, to the Visigoths, eventually to the Cathars, and or the Knights Templar. If this were so, it would explain why the treasure in question belonged both to Dagobert II and to Sion. But the authors also think that Saunier discovered a secret of some kind. On these grounds, we grew increasingly convinced that Saunier's story involved more than riches, and that it involved a secret of some kind, one that was almost certainly controversial. In other words, it seemed to us that the mystery was not confined to a remote backwater village and a 19th century priest. Whatever it was, it appeared to radiate out from rennes le chateau and produce ripples, perhaps even a potential tidal wave in the world beyond. Could Saunier's wealth have come not from anything of intrinsic financial value, but from knowledge of some kind? If so, could this knowledge have been turned to fiscal account? Could it have been used to blackmail somebody, for example? Could Saunier's wealth have been his payment for silence? After their first documentary aired, the authors got a letter from an individual who wished to remain anonymous, but who claimed to tell them what the secret that Saunier had discovered was. Our correspondent wrote with categorical certainty and authority, he made his assertions baldly and definitively with no elaboration and with apparent indifference as to whether we believed him or not. The treasure, he declared flatly, did not involve gold or precious stones. On the contrary, it consisted of incontrovertible proof that the crucifixion was a fraud and that Jesus was alive as late as A.D. 45. Even the authors themselves admit that this claim sounded preposterous to them at first, and they also admit that the correspondent failed to provide them the incontrovertible proof he claimed to exist. But they kept researching, and their studies eventually brought them into contact with a document called the Dossiers Secrets de Henri Lobineau or the secret files of Henry Lobineau. These were supposedly collected by someone called Philippe Toscan du Plantier, and they're 27 pages long, and they were deposited in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, or the National Library of France, on 
April 27, 1967. There were also other related documents that they found in the National Library. And what did these documents say? They describe the history of a secret society known as the Priory de Zion, or the Priory of Zion. A priory is a religious organization of people who've taken monastic vows and are governed either by a prior or a prioress. This particular organization was allegedly founded by Godfrey de Bouillon, who led the First Crusade to victory in 1099, and who was the first ruler of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. Although, interestingly, he refused the title king because he Mm. said Jesus is the real king. Uh, But his successors like Baldwin accepted the title king. The Priory of Zion was related, supposedly, to the Knights Templar, and according to the theory, it has continued to exist in secret as a chivalric order ever since then. Allegedly, they were at one point absorbed by the Jesuits. The Priory also has had influential leaders, including Grand Masters, such as the alchemist Nicholas Flamel of Harry Potter fame, (laughs) the artist and inventor Leonardo da Vinci, the scientist Isaac Newton, the novelist Victor Hugo, the composer Claude Debussy, and the poet Jean Cocteau. Today, they supposedly have members in all kinds of influential positions in politics and finance and other highfalutin fields, The goal of the Priory of Zion is supposed to be restoring the Merovingian bloodline to the thrones of Europe. Specifically, they're supposed to be keen to install a particular man of Merovingian descent to the currently non-existent throne of France as a figure who will be the great monarch prophesied by the astrologer Nostradamus, who we will be discussing in a future episode. (laughs) So I've heard the the name Merovingian in a uh, Matrix movie, but uh, but who were the actual Merovingians of history? They were the ruling family of the Franks between the 400s for a few centuries until 751 when the last Merovingian king was deposed and the Carolingian dynasty began. And why would the Priory of Sion want to restore a dynasty that hasn't governed France in almost 1300 years? Well, you know, secret societies need something to do to keep busy. (laughs) And there are monarchists in France, although they tend to support the House of Bourbon or the House of Orléans or the House of Bonaparte rather than the Merovingians. Also, the Priory of Zion apparently thinks they would be fulfilling Nostradamus' prophecy, and they supposedly have members who are of Merovingian descent and would like to see their family's fortunes restored. But, according to the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, there's also another reason. And, and what is that reason? According to them, the Merovingian kings belong to a line that goes back to Jesus Christ. Supposedly, Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. They had one or more children, and their descendants ended up in Europe and became part of the Merovingian bloodline. Thus, by restoring this bloodline to the thrones of Europe, the Priory of Zion would be putting the family of Jesus Christ on the throne. They also link this to the story of the Holy Grail, writing, In many of the earlier manuscripts, the Grail is called the Sangral, and even in the later version by Mallory, it is called the Sangrial. It is likely that some such form, Sangral or Sangrial, was in fact the original one. It is also likely that that one word was subsequently broken in the wrong place. In other words, Sangral or Sangrial may not have been intended to divide into Sangral or Sangreal, but into Sangral or Sangreal, or to employ the modern spelling Sangroyal or Royal Blood. That's the origin of the title of their book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. You could supposedly divide the word Sangral into either San Graal, Holy Grail, or Sang Real, Royal Blood, Royal Blood that happens to be holy because of Jesus. What do they think that would do to the Christian faith? Well, they think it would undermine the faith. They also think that the Catholic Church knows all of this and is out to suppress the truth concerning it. They think that this may be what the priest Saunier got wealthy by, that he discovered all this and he then used his knowledge of the secret to blackmail the Vatican, which paid him off to keep him quiet. 
Uh, they also think that the Vatican has been up to all kinds of skullduggery in the past to keep this a secret. Mm, like albino monks of uh, some sort. Yeah. <laughs> so, so France is a secular democracy now, not a monarchy. So what do they think the Priory of Science plan is? According to Wikipedia's page on the Priory of Zion, the authors therefore concluded that the modern goals of the Priory of Zion are the public revelation of the tomb and shrine of Sigebert IV, as well as the lost treasure of the temple in Jerusalem, which supposedly contains genealogical records that prove the Merovingian dynasty was of the Davidic line to facilitate Merovingian restoration in France, the reinstitutionalization of chivalry and the promotion of pan European nationalism the establishment of a theocratic United States of Europe, a wholly European empire politically and religiously unified through the imperial cult of a Merovingian great monarch who occupies both the throne of Europe and the Holy See, and the actual governance of Europe residing with the Priory of Zion through a one-party European parliament. So, that's the plan. Well, do they offer proof for these claims? They try to, and some of the arguments they make are quite unusual. Uh, For example, as proof of the Priory of Zion conspiracy, they offer a different conspiracy theory, one that came out in Russia in 1903 and is known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which we will be talking about in a future episode. This is a famous forgery, and it claims that there is a worldwide Jewish conspiracy to subject Gentiles to Jewish rule, in part through the manipulation of Freemasons, who will also be the subject of future episodes. According to Wikipedia, the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail also incorporated the anti-Semitic and anti-Masonic tract known as the Protocols of the Elder of Zion into their story, concluding that it was actually based on the master plan of the Priory of Zion. They presented it as the most persuasive piece of evidence for the existence and activities of the Priory of Zion by arguing that the original text on which the published version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was based had nothing to do with Judaism or, end quote, international Jewish conspiracy, end quote. It issued from a Masonic body practicing the Scottish Rite, which incorporated the word Zion into its name. The original text was not intended to be released publicly, but was a program for gaining control of Freemasonry as part of a strategy to infiltrate and reorganize church and state according to esoteric Christian principles. After a failed attempt to gain influence in the court of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, Sergei Nihilus changed the original text to forge an inflammatory tract in 1903 to discredit the esoteric clique around Papas by implying they were Judeo-Masonic conspirators and some esoteric Christian elements in the original text were ignored by Nihilus and hence remained unchanged in the anti-Semitic canard he published. So according to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion were a doctored version of a plan that actually belonged to the Priory of Zion, seeking to put Jesus' descendants on the thrones of Europe. Okay, so that's our background on the Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So what are the theories about Holy Blood, Holy Grail? Well, the authors have made a bunch of claims, all of which are either true or false. To tell their story in chronological order, Jesus didn't die on the cross. He was married to Mary Magdalene. They had offspring who represent the Holy Grail and who fed into the Merovingian dynasty of France. At the time of the Crusades, the Priory of Zion was formed and has existed in secret ever since. It has adopted as its goals restoring the Merovingian dynasty to power in Europe which will also mean replacing Catholic Orthodoxy with an esoteric version of Christianity. Esoteric means, like, hidden. And to prevent this, the Vatican has done various things, including paying off the French priest Saunier to keep it secret. At least, these are some of their major claims. They also make many minor ones as well. All right. So, obviously, there is a faith perspective on this. So, what can we say about these claims from the faith perspective? The central claim that Holy Blood, Holy Grail makes that would contradict the Christian faith is the idea that Jesus didn't die on the cross. The Christian faith teaches that Jesus did die on the cross, and so if that didn't happen, then the Christian faith would be false. But there's really good evidence that Jesus died on the cross, as we discussed in episode 37 on the resurrection of Jesus. Incidentally, when I read Holy Blood, Holy Grail back in the 1980s, 
before I was Catholic, I was intrigued by a particular passage in the book that argued that Pope John the Twenty Third, who reigned in the late 1950s and early 1960s, had subtly laid the groundwork for the idea that Jesus redeemed us without dying on the cross. According to the authors, In June 1960, he issued a profoundly important apostolic letter. This missive addressed itself specifically to the subject of the precious blood of Jesus. It ascribed a hitherto unprecedented significance to that blood. It emphasized Jesus' suffering as a human being and maintained that the redemption of mankind had been affected by the shedding of his blood. In the context of Pope John's letter, Jesus' human passion and the shedding of his blood assume a greater consequence than the resurrection or even than the mechanics of the crucifixion. The implications of this letter are enormous. As one commentator has observed, they alter the whole basis of Christian belief. If man's redemption was achieved by the shedding of Jesus' blood, his death and resurrection become incidental if not indeed superfluous. Jesus need not have died on the cross for the faith to retain its validity. So according to them, John the Twenty Third, who they argue was actually a member of the Priory of Zion, supposedly subtly shifted the basis of Christian doctrine so that Christ's death was unnecessary in line with the Priory of Zion's goals. And how plausible is that? Uh, not at all. First of all, you can read the actual letter that John the 23rd released for yourself. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. It's called Inde Aprimis, and the purpose of the letter is not to change Catholic doctrine. It's to encourage people to have devotion to the precious blood of Jesus. So this is a devotional letter. It's not meant to alter doctrine. It's just meant to foster people's devotion based on existing teaching. In the letter, John the 23rd quotes from several statements from historic Catholic authors like St. John Chrysostom about the value of Christ's shed blood, but he doesn't create any new doctrines. He just repeats existing doctrines. So their claim, could Jesus have redeemed us just by shedding his blood without actually dying? Well, it depends on what you mean. As St. Thomas Aquinas points out, God could have forgiven our sins simply by choosing to do so. So from one perspective, yes, we could have been saved without the crucifixion. But to show us the, both the gravity of our sins and the depth of his love for us, God chose to use the crucifixion as the means of our salvation. He could have also chosen a middle ground, like having Jesus suffer and shed some of his blood, but without actually dying. But that's not the choice he made. The New Testament is clear that to save us, uh, Jesus both died and rose from the dead in anticipation of our own deaths and resurrections. And in his apostolic letter, John the 23rd doesn't do anything but repeat traditional Catholic thought. The authors fail to acknowledge that the idiom shedding blood is a common euphemism for being killed. So if you say Jesus shed his blood, you mean he was killed. And John the 23rd refers not only to the crucifixion, but also to Jesus' resurrection from the dead, indicating that John the Twenty Third taught that Jesus really did die, something he's also quite explicit about in his other writings. Thus, the authors just flatly misrepresent what the Pope was doing in this letter. What about the claim that Jesus was married and had children? Would that undermine the Christian faith? It's not what Christians have historically understood, and it's offensive to pious sensibilities, but there's no statement in the New Testament that explicitly says that Jesus had no human wife and children. The New Testament provides very good evidence that he didn't, and we'll cover that in the reason section, but from the faith perspective, it wouldn't destroy the Christian faith if Jesus had chosen to marry and have children. To redeem us, Jesus needed to be the all-holy Son of God— but holiness and marriage are not incompatible. If the Son of God had chosen to take a human wife, he would have been a perfectly holy husband, and he could have still redeemed us. So this idea, as bizarre as it is, given the evidence, wouldn't actually undermine the foundations of the Christian faith. It's, it's just false. All right, so that's the faith perspective. What can we say about Holy Blood, Holy Grail from the reason perspective? Uh, to put it charitably, it falls apart on every level. <laughs> Before we look at particular ways that happens, I want to comment on 
the shoddy style of reasoning that the book employs throughout. It uses a highly speculative style of reasoning where the authors throw out dozens of possibilities one after another. You know, we saw an example of that with Saunier's treasure. You know, maybe it came from here, maybe it came from there, maybe it came from this other place. We don't know. But they they throw all these things up. And so they do that regularly. And the style of reasoning goes, well, maybe this is true. Maybe that is true. Maybe this other thing is true. And they jump from one possibility to another possibility without seriously taking into account probability and where the evidence really points. The strategy is to throw up a bunch of ideas and then instead of being hard nosed about the evidence for and against the ideas, they end up gravitating to the most sensationalistic ones. It's hard to avoid the impression that this is a deliberate strategy to get the reader excited with a, a bunch of historical baffle gab and sensationalistic possibilities. In fact, they regularly use a technique that in screenwriters is called hanging a lantern on something. When screenwriters need to have something really implausible happen to move the plot forward, they will often have a character point out how implausible the thing was. That way, they signal the audience, yeah, we know this was implausible, just ignore it and go along with us. Uh, for example, if you're watching a movie and the characters are in a dire situation where a plane is crashing and the characters manage to survive the crash, one of them may say, well, it was lucky we survived that plane crash, wasn't it? And by doing that, the authors, the writers of the screenplay acknowledge that yeah, it was unlikely that the characters would survive, but now that they've pointed that out, they can move on with the plot. This is called hanging a lantern on something because it momentarily shines light on the implausibility, like hanging up a lantern shines light on things. But the real purpose is to get the audience to ignore the implausibility and just accept what the authors want to do. Well, regularly in Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the authors will hang a lantern on implausible ideas that they want the readers to accept. They will mention a highly implausible and sensationalistic idea, and then they will say something like, but this claim seems extraordinary, incredible. You know, that's the lantern being hung. And then they move on and say something like, and yet it seems at least possible that it could be true. And that's the authors moving on. Uh, they then treat the implausible sensationalistic claim as if it's totally plausible and likely to be true. Overall, the reasoning in Holy Blood, Holy Grail is like an extreme case of what you find in bad TV documentaries that deal with mysteries and paranormal phenomena. The documentary makers, you know, you watch a lot of TV documentaries and they'll invite you to just consider the possibility that some unusual thing is true, and then they'll leave it at that, as if the idea is totally plausible now that you've just considered the possibility it's true. Now, I love mysteries, but I hate this just consider style of documentary making because it leaves out the role of evidence. That's why on Mysterious World, we always bring the discussion back to the evidence. I mean, yes, let's consider mysterious possibilities, but then let's evaluate what's likely and unlikely in terms of the evidence. Holy Blood, Holy Grail, though, is even worse than the Just Consider documentaries because it does everything it can to portray implausible con conclusions as likely to be true, no matter how flimsy the evidence. Can you give us an example of when they do that? Yeah, and this is one that I noticed when I read Holy Blood, Holy Grail back in the 1980s. In one passage, the authors write, An Australian journalist has put forward an intriguing and persuasive argument that Jesus died at Masada when the fortress fell to the Romans in A.D. 74, by which time he would have been approaching his 80th year. So, an Australian journalist has put forward a persuasive argument that Jesus died at Masada in A.D. 74. Well, the journalist was named Donovan Joyce, and he made the claim in his 1972 book, The Jesus Scroll. Now, let's read the footnote where the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail detail the persuasive argument he's, he made. Joyce claims that while in Israel, he was asked to help smuggle a stolen scroll from the Masada excavations out of the country. 
Although he refused, he claims to have seen the scroll. It was signed Yeshua ben Jacob ben Genesareth, who described himself as 80 years old and added that he was the last of the rightful kings of Israel. Page 22. The name, when translated into English, becomes Jesus of Genesareth, son of Jacob. Joyce identifies the author as Jesus of Nazareth. So already we have a bunch of red flags. Joyce's claim is based on a scroll that nobody has access to today. He claims only to have seen the scroll. As we'll see, he did not claim to have read it. And the Yeshua or Jesus mentioned in the scroll is named Ben Yaqub Ben Gennesareth, which they translate as son of Jacob, son of Gennesareth. That's a, a village in the northern part of Israel. But the biblical Jesus was Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth, not Jacob of Gennesareth. So we've got two different Jesuses and that they're conflating for no reason. But the red flags don't end there because back in the 1980s, I decided to follow up on this argument and I got a copy of the Jesus scroll, which I still have. And in it, here's what Joyce says. On the night of Monday, December 14th, 1964, an archaeologist whom I had known for the past 10 days as Professor Max Grosset, a name which he cheerfully admitted was false, accosted me at Tel Aviv's Lod Airport with an offer of $5,000 if I would perform a small service. All that I had to do was smuggle out of Israel that very night, aboard BOAC's Flight 710 to Australia, an ancient parchment scroll which he claimed to have stolen several weeks earlier from the excavations of biblical King Herod the Great's ruined fortress of Masada. According to Professor Grosset, and I have only his word for my meager knowledge of the scroll's alleged contents, it had been written on the night of April 15th, 73 AD. Again, according to Professor Grosset, the man had written his name Yeshua ben Jacob ben Genesareth. As to the rest of the information supplied by Professor Grosset, and it was a necessarily hurried discussion held, actually, in the men's lavatory at the airport, it consists of one meager fact, that the scroll author had a son and therefore had been married. So we've got even more red flags. According to Joyce, uh, he had only known the supposed archaeologist for 10 days. The supposed archaeologist was using a name that he freely admitted was false. The supposed archaeologist was an admitted antiquities thief. Donovan never read the scroll for himself. He was only told about its supposed contents. He was told about its supposed contents in a brief conversation in an airport bathroom. He was told <laughs> its contents dealt with a man named Jesus, son of Jacob of Gennesareth, not Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. And this is the basis of the persuasive argument that the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail say Donovan made for Jesus of Nazareth surviving the crucifixion and dying at Masada. I mean, come on, this argument isn't worth a pair of fetid dingo's kidneys. <laughs> and yet Donovan got a whole book out of having glanced at a, at a stolen scroll in a men's bathroom that in he, an airport. That he couldn't <laughs> read in a bathroom, yeah. <laughs> Man, somebody could get a book publishing contract for anything. All right, so let's look at some of the author's specific claims. What about the idea that the Vatican paid off the French priest Saunier to keep stuff secret, or that Saunier otherwise found an ancient treasure? Well, Saunier did have more money than a priest of his station was supposed to have, and there was a very straightforward reason for it. He was committing the crime of simony. Uh, Wikipedia's article on Saunier notes... The first scholarly book on Saunier's activities was by local historian and chief librarian of Carcassonne, René Descadeas, who sifted through the priest's account books and personal correspondence, as well as the records of Saunier's ecclesiastical trial lodged in the Carcassonne bishopric. He concluded that there never was any treasure or mystery. All of the priest's wealth was generated from selling masses and accepting donations. The 2005 Channel 4 documentary, The Real Da Vinci Code, presented by Tony Robinson, arrived at the same conclusion, followed by the 2006 CBS News 60 Minutes documentary, Priory of Zion, presented by Ed Bradley, who said, The source of the wealth of the priest of Rennes le Chateau was not some ancient mysterious treasure, but good old-fashioned fraud. According to canon law, priests are allowed to say up to three masses per day, 
and to accept a fee for requested prayers for the dead. Sonier, however, had been soliciting and accepting money via the post to say thousands of masses, charging one franc per mass. Some clients would send payment for hundreds of masses, which he never actually performed. So Sonier was a confidence trickster who broke canon law by illegally accepting excessive donations for masses he never said. No ancient treasure, no blackmail of the Vatican. In fact, the religious authorities suspended him because of his criminal behavior. So what about the idea that there's a secret society known as the Priory of Zion, which has existed since the Crusades and is trying to restore the Merovingian kings to power? Well, there was an organization known as the Priory of Zion, but it wasn't a secret society stemming from the Crusades. The facts about it are well known, and as Wikipedia's page on the Priory of Zion notes, The Priory de Zion, translated as Priory of Zion, was a fraternal organization founded and dissolved in France in 1956 by Pierre Plantard. The 1901 French Law of Associations required that the Priory of Zion be registered with the government, although the statutes and the registration documents are dated May 7, 1956. The registration took place at the sub-prefecture of Saint-Julien-en-Genevois on June 25, 1956, and recorded in the Journal Officiel de la République Française on July 20, 1956. The headquarters of the Priory of Zion and its journal circuit were based in the apartment of Plantard in a social housing block known as Soukassan, newly constructed in 1956. The statutes of the Priory of Zion indicate its purpose was to allow and encourage members to engage in studies and mutual aid. The articles of the association expressed the goal of creating a traditionalist Catholic chivalric order. The formally registered association was dissolved sometime after October 1956 but intermittently revived for different reasons by Plantard between 1961 and 1993, though in name and on paper only. So the real Priory of Zion was an organization that was founded by a guy named Pierre Plantard in 1956, and it folded in the same year, though he later revived it a few times. It was based out of his apartment, and its purpose was to create a Catholic cheval recorder, and that didn't happen. What do we know about Pierre Plantard? He was born in 1920, and he died in the year 2000, and he was a French draftsman and a con artist. As Wikipedia's page on Plantard notes, Plantard was given a six-month sentence in December 1953 for abuse de confiance, breach of trust, relating to other crimes. And as part of his con arting, he also became a forger. Uh, remember the secret dossier that the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail found in the National Library of France? You know, the one that provided the basis of the claim that the Priory of Zion dates back to the Crusades and is trying to reinstall Merovingian kings? Plantard wrote that, along with a guy named Philippe de Cherisse. They falsely attributed this to someone they called Philippe Toscan du Plantier, and they then deposited the dossier in the library on April 27, 1967. Plantard also collaborated with another man, the French author Gerard de Sade. Uh, remember the book that Henry Lincoln originally got in France, which dealt with the unexplained wealth of Saunier. That book was originally published as L'Or de Rennes, uh, or The Gold of Rennes, and it was based on a manuscript that Pierre Plantard wrote. But Plantard couldn't get it published, and so he let de Sade rewrite it so that it could get published. The two later fell out over royalty payments, and the gold of Rennes also contains forged documents related to the Merovingian kings. And uh, Plantard wasn't only a con man and a forger, he was an ambitious con man and forger, because Guess who the various forged documents indicate is the legitimate descendant of the Merovingian kings today? It's Plantard himself. Now, that's right. He's apparently supposed to be the legitimate heir of the throne of France and the great monarch predicted by Nostradamus. Do you think he really wanted to become king of France? It's hard to say. You know, as we mentioned, there are monarchists in France, uh, but France is, France is such a secular democracy these days that it's hard to imagine a scenario that would put anybody, Plantard or otherwise, on the throne in our lifetimes. As a result, some people have suggested that Plantard 
created all this stuff just as a prank for his own amusement, or he might have done it to create an atmosphere of mystery around himself to help his side business as a clairvoyant. <laughs> so he was not only a draftsman, but also a psychic. And he bestowed degrees from esoteric orders on people. So he could have had any number of motives and reason to want to create mystery around himself. It's clear, though, that um, this was all a bunch of bunk. Plantard's co-author, Gerard de Sede, later wrote another book, distancing himself from the claims in L'Or de René. And in 2005, de Sede's son, Arnaud, gave an interview to the UK's Channel 4, in which the following exchange occurred. Gerard de Sede wrote a second book exposing the hoax he'd helped to launch. When your father died, did he believe that there was an organisation called the Priory of Sion? Oh, no. I, mean, I think he has uh, said several times that this organisation was uh, a figment of, uh, of a plant house imagination, basically. It is absolutely full. So both de Sede and his son later acknowledged that the whole thing was false. And things didn't end well for Plantard himself. As Wikipedia's page on him notes, a 1989 Priory of Sion circular cited Roger Patrice Pilat as a Grand Master of the Priory of Sion. Pilat was a friend of the then President of France, François Mitterrand, and at the center of a scandal involving French Prime Minister Pierre Bergevoy. This initiative by Plantard had an unexpected consequence. In October 1993, the judge investigating the Pilat scandal had Pierre Plantard's house searched. The search failed to find any documents related to Palat, but turned up a horde of false documents, including some proclaiming Plantard the true king of France. Plantard admitted under oath he had fabricated everything, including Palat's involvement with the Priory of Sion. Plantard was later threatened with legal action by the Palat family and therefore disappeared to his house in southern France. He was 74 years old at the time. Nothing more was heard of Plantard until he died in Paris on February 3, 2000. His remains were cremated. So Plantard admitted under oath that he had fabricated everything, and then he went into seclusion. All right, so what about this idea that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and that they had offspring who represent the Holy Grail and who fed into the Merovingian dynasty? Well, this was a bridge too far even for Plantard. He did not claim this. It was an idea that the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail came up with themselves, and Plantard rejected it. In a 1982 interview on French radio, he said, I admit that Holy Blood, Holy Grail is a good book, but one must say that there is a part that owes more to fiction than to fact, especially in the part that deals with the lineage of Jesus. How can you prove a lineage of four centuries from Jesus to the Merovingians? I have never put myself forward as a descendant of Jesus Christ. So even Plantard recognized the impossibility of showing the author's claims regarding Jesus's alleged bloodline. And there's good reason to reject the idea altogether. Despite arguments to the contrary, there is good evidence that, as Christians have always believed, Jesus wasn't married. I've gone through the arguments both for and against him having a wife in an inexpensive Kindle book that you can get on Amazon. It's called Was Jesus Married? And we'll have a link to it in the show notes. But for now, let me just mention two key points of evidence. First, the Gospels report in Matthew 19 that when the disciples asked whether it was better to remain unmarried, Jesus replied by saying, Not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. So Jesus indicated that although celibacy isn't for everyone, being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven is preferable and that those who can accept it should. He therefore held up celibacy for spiritual reasons as a superior state. But it would be very unexpected if the founder of the movement held up an ideal that he himself was known not to meet. Jesus would be telling people that he was spiritually inferior and that would have provoked comment. There would have been a note that even though Jesus said, this is better. He himself was not married and didn't do it. So he would have been one of the people who couldn't accept it. And that would have 
you know, if you're if you're if you think you're you're following the son of God who's all holy and he's not meeting his own standard, that's going to get comment. Second, in multiple books of the Bible by different authors, the church is depicted as the bride of Christ that Jesus is married mystically to his church. But that image would never have arisen if there was a literal human Mrs. Jesus somewhere. It's only in the absence of a human wife that the metaphor of the church as the bride of Christ would take hold among Jesus' followers. This is the flip side of him being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus refrained from human marriage so he could perform his mission, including his death, and thus serve his church to whom he's mystically married. There are also other arguments, but to read them, check out my Kindle book, Was Jesus Married? What about the argument that Jesus didn't die on the cross? This is one of the places where Holy Blood, Holy Grail is the weakest. Uh, The New Testament authors repeatedly emphasize the fact that Jesus died. Uh, The Gospels contain multiple indications of this, like when Jesus' chest is pierced by the Roman soldier's spear and blood and water flow out, indicating that either his pleural cavity or the pericardial sac around his heart was pierced. And there's just no way to survive that. The only way that the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail can argue that Jesus didn't die is by cherry-picking the data in the Gospels, accepting bits of evidence whenever they fit their theory, and simply dismissing the evidence that doesn't fit. And that's not scholarship. If you can reject any data that doesn't fit your theory, then you can prove anything, and that means you don't prove anything, because the contrary can also be proven by ignoring evidence selectively. The evidence that Jesus died on a cross is so strong that we're considering it here from the reason perspective rather than the faith perspective, because you don't need Christian faith to accept this historical fact. The overwhelming majority of scholars, including antagonistic ones like Bart Ehrman, acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross. That's what the cross was for. It was for killing people. That's why Romans crucified people, and they were very good at it. So, you know, we don't need to belabor the point here, but if you'd like more background on this, listen to episode 37 of Mysterious World on the Resurrection of Jesus. Is there anything else we should know about Holy Blood, Holy Grail? There's there's a lot we could say, but uh, one thing we've already mentioned is that the basic theses of this book were lifted by the novelist Dan Brown for The Da Vinci Code, and that didn't please the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Two of them sued Dan Brown for copyright infringement, but they lost their case. Interestingly, the judge who ruled against them, uh, Judge Peter Smith, embedded a secret code in his ruling, (laughs) and we'll have a link to that. It's called the Smithy Code. That's awesome. And so, uh, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on Holy Blood, Holy Grail? Uh, Holy Holy Blood, Holy Grail is pure bunk, and it's badly done bunk. It's so badly done that it's hard to believe the authors actually believe what they write. It may well be something they just did to make money, possibly with an ideological edge because they wanted to take a poke at Christianity. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners uh, to to go deeper into this? Well, we'll have a link to the book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. We'll also have a link to my Kindle book, Was Jesus Married? There are also the original BBC documentaries that the book was based on. Those are on YouTube. We'll have a link to that. We'll have links to Wikipedia's articles on Michael Bajant, Richard Lee, Henry Lincoln, on the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail itself, also on Gerard de Sed and Berenger Saunier, Pierre Plantard, the Priory of Zion, the Secret Dossiers, and also we'll have a link to those or to much of the Secret Dossier in French. So if you want to read that, that's available online. We'll also have a link to John the Twenty Third's letter in De A Primus and a documentary on YouTube called The Real Da Vinci Code, and then we'll also have links to Mysterious World episodes that are relevant, episode 16 on the destruction of the temple, episode 37 on the resurrection of Jesus, and episode 56 on the Knights Templar, and then finally Wikipedia's article on The Smithy Code. All right, excellent. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback from listeners. Uh, This time they're uh, feedback we gathered from our episode on Flat Earth. 
And our first bit of feedback is Jorge from Boston, who sent in this email when he said, when you interviewed the airline pilot guy, you asked him if traveling directly from San Francisco to Richmond, you would have to keep steering left or else go over a state that's too far north. He answered no to both questions. However, I don't know whether he understood that by flying directly between these two cities, you meant flying along the 37th parallel. On a sphere, the shortest, most direct path between two cities with the same latitude is not along the parallel joining them, but rather along a great circle of the sphere. Mathematicians call this the geodesic path. In the case of San Francisco and Richmond, the geodesic path would take you approximately over Denver, Colorado. This is not as far north as the straight path on a flat earth would take you, but it is certainly farther north than you would expect if you thought you were going along the 37th parallel. This is a good point, and I want to thank Jorge for that. Uh, a couple other people also pointed this out, and yes, it's true. On a sphere, the shortest distance between two points is a geodesic. It wouldn't be following the the parallel, and so there is a difference there, and the differences on a trip from San Diego or from uh, San Francisco to Richmond would be a little bit different, but the fundamental point still remains that you don't have the kind of turning if you're following a parallel or a geodesic, you don't have the kind of turning that you would need to circumnavigate the North Pole on a flat Earth. It would involve more turning and you would end up in a different point in the middle of the journey than if you were tracking either a geodesic or a uh, parallel. All right. And then Kelly B. on Facebook writes, I really enjoyed this episode. I do appreciate that you and Dom are truly fair to all viewpoints. It would be easy and cheap to mock the flat earth believers, but you avoided this. I do wonder what the flat earthers believe is the reason for the big cover-up. If the earth is flat, what benefit is there to going through the massive cover-up spanning centuries? Does making people think the earth is round when it is actually flat somehow give them power or money? If there is a giant conspiracy, what would be the reason? This is something that I, uh, you know, that was a long episode, and so I didn't have a chance to go into everything I wanted, but... I can't say all flat earthers have this motivation, but the most prominent explanation that I've seen in flat earthers make for why there would be this giant conspiracy is that it's to undermine religion, that you have these atheistic people who want to hide the fact we're living on a flat earth because otherwise, if people knew the earth was flat, it would cause them to have more faith in the Bible and they don't want that. This is a difficult charge to sustain, though, since, you know, as we covered, since the time of the Church Fathers, the Church has been fully aware we're living on a sphere. The Church has been advocating that idea and saying this is quite compatible with the Bible. So how it would undermine faith in Christianity or the Bible to say we're living on a sphere is not clear because that's been the majority position uh, in the Christian Church down through the centuries. And then Christian Castillo writes on YouTube, Well, Jimmy, I'm only listening to something about the flat earth because of you. You're truly amazing when it comes to being impartial and kind. That is one of the goals. Thank you. I try to practice the golden rule of apologetics and treat everybody's ideas the way I would want mine treated. And uh, Jim Morrison in Paris, I wonder if it's that Jim Morrison, uh, would be uh, very truly remarkable. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim Morrison in Paris writes on YouTube, uh, Jimmy Aiken is the most charitable conspiracy debunker on YouTube. Well done, sir. <laughs> Thank you, and you're very kind. Sam's Hearing Aid Centers on YouTube writes, the only thing a flat earther has to fear is a sphere itself. <laughs> yeah, nice wordplay. <laughs> Yeah, it's very good. Uh, all right, so then let's move on to our mysterious headlines. Uh, Jimmy, what's our mysterious headlines this week? Well, we have a theme of a couple of headlines or a couple of links that are updates on previous stories. So the Mama Nerd, uh, by email, sends a link to the third International Flat Earth Conference. And so I will resist saying that gathered flat earthers from all over the globe. Um, <laughs> but you can you can check that out. And then also, back in episode 26, we talked about the mysterious death of Jimmy Hoffa and what was revealed about it in a book called I Heard You Paint Houses. And we noted at the time that that was being made into a film 
for Netflix by Martin Scorsese, and the film is called The Irishman. Uh, well, The Irishman is now out on Netflix, and we'll have a link to an article in Variety that uh, notes that 26 million people watched it in its first week. And so it's been extremely popular, and people have really been talking about The Irishman. And It's kind of a long movie, so some people are watching it in stages, but uh, it's out now on Netflix, and you can watch it for yourself. Yeah, I was going to say I need to uh, set aside three hours to watch it because I, I do want to see it, especially since we talked about uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, I have to point out, by the way, the, the Mama Nerd, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a connection to her. That That's oh. my mother-in-law. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. Oh, cool. So, yeah, that's Pat Scott, who uh, folks often hear on The Secrets of Technology. Uh, she participates there. So she's a big fan of uh, of all of our SQPN podcasts, of course. So, uh, cool. so that's great. That's our headlines. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? It's going to be about religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, before we sign off, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Nate F., Mardell B., Felix L., Claudia S., and James K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give. Make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail and what Jimmy had to say about it? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash mysterious or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page or by sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, or you can send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of Mysterious Feedback. Uh, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in every episode of the show. And then you can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the Mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>